So very pleased to be here. I want to talk quite specifically about uh, part of competitiveness, uh, labour market flexibility. And I think competitiveness itself is very nebulous and hard to define. And I think labour market flexibility is also a similar problem. Uh, it's talked about a lot and it's thrown around a lot, but it's not often discussed what it means and exactly how it works and what impact it has. And I want to look at specifically the UK response to the recent financial crisis and how the UK's uh, excellent labour market flexibility helped it respond to the crisis and is now helping its economic recovery. So in the aftermath of the crisis, the UK uh, suffered a, a serious shock and real GDP went down by around 6% um, at, at its worst. Um, but Despite this large fall in output, there wasn't a significant fall in employment. And obviously when responding to a sharp fall in out output, firms can either try to cut wages uh, and cut hours, or they can try to cut uh, employment and try and stay profitable. Uh, in the UK's case, we saw that um, it very much focused on the real wage cuts, uh, and employment was actually able to stay very high. And this is a graph comparing employment in the current um, recession to previous recessions in the UK. And as you can see, the employment rate stayed relatively high, didn't decrease much, and has increased quite quickly. And the unemployment rate rose a couple of percent, but has decreased relatively quickly as well. And it's not just uh, fared well in employment terms compared to previous recessions in the UK, it also fared pretty well compared to other countries in the current recession. And here we see the UK compared to uh, the US, the EU average and the Eurozone average. Again, you can see the employment rate uh, stayed very high and is actually above pre-crisis levels now, um, whereas other countries have struggled much more. And the unemployment rate, uh, while it rose slightly, did not rise as much as other countries and has recovered quite quickly and is now down close to 5% uh, in 2015. This data only goes to 2014. But um, the point being that the response did not see a huge increase in unemployment uh, and that it was taken much more on the real wages, which I think is traditionally a harder approach in terms of uh, accommodating a shock uh, and responding to a crisis. And as we can see here in the right hand graph, uh, the, the bold line shows real wages in this current recession uh, and clearly they've been kept very low and that's allowed firms to cut costs um, and respond to the crisis and stay profitable without uh, laying off significant numbers of workers, which we've seen in other countries. And so I want to talk a little bit about why this is specifically important. Um, obviously, you know, it sort of goes without saying that keeping people in employment is a good thing. Uh, but there are a few specific reasons why it helped the UK. Obviously, uh, not having to lay off large amounts of people creates much less distortion in the labour market and much less distortion in society as a whole. Um, the firms were able to keep this labour on hand in one form or another that is now being redeployed in the recovery. Uh, so they have this human capital there to quickly pick up any slack and also respond to renewed demand. It avoided a loss or deterioration in skills of the workforce. Uh, often we see when people are laid off, uh, particularly long-term unemployed, their skills deteriorate. Uh, they don't have the skills needed and the training needed to get back into work. So that was a problem that was avoided with this approach. Um, breaking down and rebuilding a workforce for a firm is an incredibly costly process. No matter how flexible your labour force is, I think there is always a cost involved in hiring and firing and therefore avoiding that process has helped firms stay much more profitable. Uh, and also the UK uh, is having a very demand and consumption led recovery and I think keeping people in work and keeping their money and incomes flowing has helped that come about. I mean again it's not perfect and we would like to see a more diversified recovery but here the labour market flexibility has helped it respond and it has helped people pick up their spending um, when the economy started to turn around. And also, I think in political terms, it is an easier adjustment to make. Um, we've seen in many countries a huge increase in unemployment has had severe political fallout, the rise of populist parties, and the rise of bad policies. And I think that has been avoided by keeping people in employment. Fall in real wages is not without its own um, political fallout, but I don't think it's been quite as stark as we've seen in other other countries. And we also can see businesses are very much in favour of this approach. This is a survey from the CBI, the biggest business organisation in the UK. 
And as we can see, they, they believe that labour market flexibility plays an important role in helping them respond to fluctuating demand, as you see in an economic shock, and also responding to new growth opportunities, as we see in a recovery. Uh, and it also allows them to employ people uh, and keep people on that maybe they couldn't otherwise. So I think it's really helped in that sense. And uh, I want to drill a bit more into what are the specific policy approaches that the UK has taken to get this kind of labour market set up. And this is the World Economic Forum Global Competitiveness Index, and you can see the UK fares very well on labour market efficiency, and it ranks uh, very highly in that point. It ranks fifth in the world. Um, specifically, the policies I would look at here, I'll go through them one by one, but particularly flexible wage determination, and this is obviously a long-standing approach in the UK, brought in under Margaret Thatcher in the 80s. Um, but uh, there's been a significant um, decentralisation of uh, wage bargaining. It's done very much at the firm level, very much at the individual level, and a decreased role for trade unions. That's helped with these kinds of adjustments when it comes to uh, putting the onus on real wages rather than the onus on employment adjustments. And I think this is something that has become basically a political consensus in the UK, that this kind of approach is positive and it receives almost cross-party support. And those reforms that were started by Thatcher in the 80s were continued by Major, Blair, and now Cameron. Uh, and so it's really a significant part of the UK's labour market approach. We also see a lot of flexibility in the types of contracts that people can take on and the hours that they can work. And I think another reason why firms were able to avoid laying people off is because clearly they were able to move them to part-time contracts, to temporary contracts, to uh, fixed period contracts, or even to what's known as a zero hour contract, where you don't have any fixed working hours, but you have a lot of flexibility. Um, and as we can see from this graph here, even in you know, the immediate aftermath of a recession, there was a strong demand still for some part-time workers. So while they were laying off full-time workers, they were picking up part-time workers, and that's created a big part of the employment growth going forward. Um, so clearly, I think that has been a very important part of keeping people in employment, allowing them to switch between full-time and part-time work, and be on hand there to move back into full-time work when the recovery became more established. We can also see from this graph another interesting point. There's been a significant growth in the number of self-employed people in the aftermath of the crisis. And you can see it starting in here and growing to almost 50% or, or a majority of the employment growth now is coming from growth in self-employed. This is a bit of a double-edged sword, I believe, but for the most part, I think it's a good thing. Um, while moving to self-employment does sometimes mean a reduction in incomes for people, polls have shown that people tend to be happier when they're self-employed, uh, and I think it's very important in terms of creating a driver for the economy and diversifying the economy that people are able to move into self-employment. I think this goes well beyond labour market policies. Uh, clearly it's about creating a wider business climate where it's very easy to start a business and very easy to become self-employed. Uh, if you look at the ease of doing business reports, the UK is seventh and 17th in the world in starting a business, up from 43rd in 20, uh, 2015 to 2016. So it's made a huge jump in recent years and continues to improve. Uh, and currently, starting a business takes only four procedures and around four and a half days in the UK. And in terms of just implementing and starting that business, it costs next to nothing. Of course, you will have to put, put capital and time in, but the procedural and administrative part of it is very small and I think that's made it very easy for people to move uh, from full-time employment for firms into self-employment and that's helped keep employment up overall. And as we also heard, another important to this is um, insolvency law and the cost of failure. And I think in the UK, the cost of failing in a business venture of, in being self-employed is very low and therefore there is an incentive to take that chance if the alternative is just to be unemployed. And I think another aspect is the incentives to work. And um, there's a quote here from Christopher Pissarides, the Nobel Prize winner, who's looked at this uh, extensively. But I think the point is that it's been a long-term policy of the UK and of uh, successive governments to move away from significant unemployment benefits, to try to reduce the incentives when out of work, increase the incentives in work. That has meant some structuring of benefits in work, 
again, not ideal from a free market perspective, but it has helped people move more into employment than staying out of employment. We've also seen significant uh, reforms in terms of raising the pension age, uh, increasing the flexibility of pensions and moving away from defined benefit schemes. And we've also seen changes to the tax system, so it incentivises work more and raising the threshold uh, from which people have to start paying tax. So again, you get more tax-free income. So all of these things, again, I think in the recession help people stay in employment and help firms keep them on. But to what extent are all of these factors that help the UK respond so well um, replicable? And I think many of the ones I've talked about, uh, wage bargaining, uh, flexibility in contracts and hours, are in theory replicable. We have these political problems we've heard about, but there are also some other issues and, and um, approaches which maybe aren't as easy to replicate. Um, the UK obviously is a key source uh, for immigration and attracting talent and high school workers. That's helped to create a very flexible, knowledgeable workforce. That's not something that is easy replicable. Not everyone has the draw of London, of being a cultural and political centre. Um, obviously not every country can take the amount of immigration that the UK has taken. Uh, it's a highly skilled economy and a service-driven economy. There are significant sunk costs invested in workers in the UK. Uh, and as such, because of the UK's labour market makeup, a lot of firms were more willing to hold on to workers um, during the crisis rather than laying them off. And it's not clear if that is replicable across different types of economic structures in different countries. And also in terms of the real wage adjustment, one thing that was important was that in the aftermath of the crisis, inflation rebounded allowing for real wages to be adjusted and not just rely on nominal cuts. And as we all know, downward rigidity in wages is very strong, even in the most flexible labour markets. So I think it's, it's proved that that, that was a, an external factor as well that helped the UK's um, response. Uh, I think finally we do have to question as well is, you know, this is not all perfect. There are different approaches. And is this the type of thing that a country would want to replicate? I mean, we've already seen that you have the risk of prolonged real, uh, real wages being low. That itself, as I said, has political fallout and could hamper uh, confidence in the economy and confidence in the recovery. We also have this very serious productivity problem in the UK, where, as you can see, before the crisis, the UK was one of the fastest growing economies in terms of productivity growth. But since the crisis, it's been one of the worst, and it has, remains very subdued in terms of our productivity growth. This is to be expected to an extent because we have uh, high levels of employment but lower levels of output, uh, so productivity per worker seems lower, but it can't all be explained by that. And I think there is a, a longer term problem under here in terms of investment and you know, redeployment of capital to where it's efficient. And this is something that was touched upon in the other speeches, the idea of creative destruction and uh, redeploying capital from inefficient firms to more efficient firms. And you know, the Lithuanian example was mentioned, and I think it worked very well there. Uh, they were able to shed workers quickly, and those workers were able to go into different uh, sectors of the economy, different firms where they were needed eventually. Uh, and I think that hasn't happened in the UK, and that labour hoarding and that lack of redeployment could have hampered the productivity growth. Of course, equally, this is not a perfect approach. We've heard about the Greek example where they fired lots of workers and they didn't go anywhere. So it's, um, you know, there is no uh, perfect approach here, and, and you, know, you have to figure out which one works best for the specific economy. We're seeing other issues in the UK in terms of poor matching of skills. Again, um, workers aren't necessarily uh, applying their skills as well as they can. They don't have the right skills to meet the demand we're seeing in the UK. This is a longer term problem about investment and education, but if you have labour being hoarded in the wrong sectors, that sends the wrong messages down the line to what sort of skills are needed in terms of education and investment. So I think there is a longer term structural issue there as well. Uh, and then we have seen uh, in some cases, firms favouring cheap labour uh, with the low real wages over the higher levels of business investment. Um, and in the long term, the lack of that investment could hamper uh, productivity growth and economic recovery. So it's, a, it, it's not all perfect, but I think the bigger picture point for me is that a very flexible labour market allowed the UK to respond to a very serious crisis in a very um, a, a placid way. It allowed employment to stay high. It allowed uh, people to stay in their jobs and also move into self-employment 
and it lessened the distortions and lessened the shock uh, in a way that was um, much, much easier for the UK as an economy and as a society to deal with. And so I think there's a lot of validity in, in reforming in this way. And I think looking at Slovakia's numbers, anecdotally, they rank quite low, uh, almost 100 in terms of labour market efficiency in the World Econ Economic uh, Forum's competitiveness index. So I think there is a lot of a way to go in these kinds of reforms. Thank you.